Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 28, Diagnosing Defects. Hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. It is 2.30 Mountain Time here in Albuquerque, New Mexico from the Imbrilliant Studios. As you know, I am coming from here as I do every Friday to bring you the take up. And today we have diagnosing defects going on. Now, what I'm going to say first and foremost, guys, is, uh, you know, there's always an extra lesson that comes with the take up. And sometimes that extra lesson comes in the form of doing live work, live uh, broadcasting for me. The extra lesson today was perseverance. Uh, I had some camera issues, had trouble, had to reboot, lost my setup, lost my notes, had some issues where I couldn't have all my stuff ready. But what we're going to do is keep soldiering on. And that's something that we know we have to do fairly frequently when we're dealing with things like defects in our embroidery. We have to kind of persevere and keep on working no matter what happens. And frankly, it is only failure if we, one, don't learn anything, and two, let ourselves be put down by it. If we continue to get up every time we fall, it's not failure. So what I'll say is uh, pat myself on the back today and say, despite the fact that I was uh, just coming in under the wire and that this may be a little bit of a fly by the seat of your pants episode, I'm going to come in here and deliver as best I can and get you guys talking about uh, diagnosing defects in your embroidery. And chiefly, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, digitizing because usually, as you know, I'm a digitizer. That is my primary field. And so most of the time when I'm talking to people, it's about, hey, is something wrong with my file? And I'm going to say a lot of times, no. A lot of the things that I see are not things that are wrong with the file. We're going to talk about some examples, talk about some different ways we can look at that, and really just discuss where do defects come from? What are common things to look for? And uh, what do I do when someone asks me, hey, what's wrong with this file? What's wrong with this embroidery? What can I do to fix it? Uh, how do I diagnose that stuff? But before we get started, let's go ahead and say hi to everybody who is here in the chat and hanging out. Uh, first thing, uh, Christine Shreve. Hi, Christine. Happy to see you here. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you and to everybody out there who's watching the take up today. Uh, always great stuff. Great to see you, Christine. Mike Muldowney is in saying hello. Hello, Mike. Carol Chapman's on. Hey, Carol. Jeff Fuller of MNerd, who's doing a lot of great education work himself. Always good to see him in. Hello, all. Hello, Jeff. Justin, who is a digitizer himself, Justin Armenta. <laughs> Hello, Dr. E. Rich is in to diagnose these defects. You know, I wish I could have diagnosed the problems I had with my webcam earlier. It would have been a little bit easier to diagnose embroidery defects today. What I'll say is, uh, Justin, you understand what's up because as a digitizer, I'm sure you've had a million people show you something that's running wrong on a machine that has a materials issue, maybe has an issue in execution and say, man, your file's messed up. Well, I'll say, uh, I'm not just going to defend digitizers today. I'm sure there's enough of that out there. But the truth of the matter is there's a lot of things that we can't fix in digitizing, but there are some things we can. So we'll then talk about that. Also, we're going to talk about the difference between uh, why or how we go about fixing things, because sometimes there's more than one way to handle it. Now, we'll talk about that as we get to going. So uh, let's see who else is here in the chat before we get started. Uh, Rebecca Moonflower. Rebecca, uh, hey there. Happy to see you here. Frank Dunn from out in the UK. Happy to see you. Good evening to everybody out his way. Aaron is here. Hey, Aaron. I've got, uh, got to talk to you about some other stuff. I get people's messages and sometimes I don't get to answer them right before the show, but uh, more things to discuss absolutely as we get going. Uh, Linda Russell. Hey, 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 Linda. Donna Scott Johnson. Hey, glad to be here. Education Friday. I hope so. I hope we have some good stuff there, folks. And oh, 15 seconds of the first E Rich. Yeah, no, the E Rich blast from Justin. I'll bring it back up. Yep, Dr. E Rich. Apparently, now I've got Dr. and E Rich to deal with today. <laughs> you never know. Uh, Ramon says, it's Eric Day. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for uh, being here. Everybody, when you come and you listen and you cooperate with everybody and get in on the comments when you help, you are as much a part of this as I am. I am happy to be here for you and serve you as best as I can. And I'm happy to see you guys serving each other. Uh, Brian Bailey, uh, inventor and maker of Imbrilliant Software. Uh, hello, Friday friends. He's got something to say, I'm sure, as well, because everybody does the same thing with the software. They like to blame software when a lot of the times it's execution. But anyway, let's get back to a few more hellos before we get finished here. Uh, we have Sonia saying, hi, everyone. Hey, Sonia. Hi, Dave. Today's been a fun day playing with new things in embroidery. That is awesome to hear. I like to see people spending some time, especially on a Friday. I always love to have that end of Friday playtime. If you are not doing embroidery yourself, if you're someone who has a department with embroiderers in it, or if you are an embroiderer but have other people working with you, 
make some time for everybody to play and make something they want. Friday, 20% time is a great way to do this. Give everybody a couple hours to make something they want and play with some new materials, do a new topic, learn something on a webinar, and it will advance your shop massively compared to people who aren't thinking about it. So good to see that from Heidi. Hello, Josh Wiley, happy to see you here. Uh, Andres, happy to see you here. Hi there. Don Carrier, Harry, Eric Gang, good to finally make it back. Glad to have you on, Don. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, what's your insure trims after blah points at, at? Yeah, I answer a lot of questions about different things, <laughs> both in Brilliant Software and outside of Brilliant Software. Kelly's saying hi. Hi, Kelly. Aaron's in. I, yeah, well, like I said, I'll talk to you later. And Leanne, uh, first time here. Good to have you in, Leanne. Thank you for being here on the show. Hopefully this kind of rough and tumble show I'm gonna have today since we had some technical issues will not turn you off of checking out the rest of like the 27 episodes if you wanna check them out on YouTube or Facebook. So uh, glad to have everybody in. Thank you for showing up. It is awesome to get started on this Friday, but with that, let's start to actually get into the meat of the matter. And I want you guys to comment. This is something where I think we all have something to say. We've all dealt with dealing with some sort of uh, problems we're having on the machine, problems we're having with a file, problems we're having with execution. And I would love for have everybody check in and play around with me as well today in the comments, talk about what we're doing. But primarily, primarily, we're talking about how we're going to diagnose things as they come up. And frequently, this is the first question we, we're, we're handling, right? This is the first thing that we're talking about. Is the problem we're having something in the digitizing versus the execution, right? The digitizing versus the execution is usually the first problem that comes up whenever somebody jumps on, especially if there's someone who's not digitizing themselves. Uh, if it's someone who has just you know, embroidering, using stock designs, using digitizers and contracting the work, pretty frequently they don't particularly know, especially if they're new, where this is coming from, where problems are coming from. And I think it's really important for us to talk briefly about uh, how you kind of isolate when something is digitizing versus when it's something in execution. And these are some of the things that I look for. So we're gonna go through just some really quick kind of basic points of what I first start to look for whenever somebody asks me, hey, does this file look wrong? Uh, number one, the first thing always is for me, if there's something like thread breaks, it's one of the issues that we deal with pretty commonly. If something's breaking thread, the first question I'm always going to ask when we're talking about is this digitizing or execution, I'm gonna say, all right, if you've run this on multiple garments, especially if you run it more than once, is the thread break happening in the same area? Because if it's happening in the same area, what I mean the same area, it's not necessarily the same place. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit, but are we reliably getting to the same couple of stitches, same few stitches, same individual point on the item in the design? And are we then getting a thread break at that point? When we're getting a thread break at that point, and especially if you ask them, hey, are there very short stitches surrounding it? Because we know we can cause thread breaks by having multiple short stitches closely together when we're slamming the needle over and over into the same spot, maybe even trying to drop down the same hole that we've just punched in with the earlier stitch, that we can end up with thread breaks. And especially if we're running any sort of uh, needle that's sharp. Sharper needles, I find, will have more tendency to cause thread breaks if you're doing this. But we can have a point at which we are jamming too many needle penetrations in one small area. That can be a digitizing issue. The only problem I have with this, this is the caveat to that, is that you also have to look at the construction of the garment or item they're on. Because if someone tells me, okay, yep, it's definitely happening in the same place every time, especially if we're discussing caps, because a lot of this happens in caps, right? Definitely you wanna ask them, okay, is it on the seam? Because then we can have the other thing where it's not necessarily digitizing or execution entirely, it's also materials and construction. Because the material we're going through can also cause abrasion, cause friction, cause heat to build up, can snag things, can make things break. And the dead center seam of a, of a uh, six panel hat that's constructed will frequently cause thread breaks through other means, through passing through all that material, especially if we're having issues with the thread as well. So here's the thing. First thing to look for if we're talking about, is this something that's happening in execution? Is it happening in digitizing? Definitely, is it happening at the same place over and over again? And honestly, even if we're talking about one of the other problems, it's very common, right? We're gonna talk about this repeatedly, registration. Uh, do my outlines line up? we can discuss that being part of digitizing as well. Because the thing is, there's a difference between whether we're gonna compensate for a problem. We can compensate for problems in execution too. I don't wanna say this, but let me say this as an in-house digitizer, I have frequently made a file that compensated for, for weaknesses either with my machine or with the way things were executed, or if not weaknesses for limitations with the garment that I'm working on. 
You can compensate for things, and we all do. We compensate for things that we know are going to occur. So there's whether we are eliminating something or we're compensating for it, there's something to be said for that. But thread breaks in specific, looking for whether they happen at the same time every time. And if they happen on more than one needle, it's another thing to check for. If they're having thread breaks fraying like that, I'm like, all right, well, have we tried more than one needle? Is it in the same place in the design every time? Uh, if we change the needle, does it have the same time happening? And especially the other thing we can end up doing is looking for on a multi-head machine, is it happening in the same way on every head? Because we can start to isolate what we're looking for. What are we looking for when we say this stuff? We're trying to find out if there is something we can eliminate. If it's happening on every head of a multi-head machine at the same place in the design, that is a good chance this is happening because of the file. So that's probably something that's wrong in the digitizing the execution. Uh, if you're using software, you go look at that point in the file and you say, do I have multiple layers of stitching at high densities that are all on top of each other? Do I have tiny short stitches or too many short stitches in a row? Do I have an area where I'm packing too much detail in? This is something that very likely could be due to digitizing, even though it may sometimes look like a machine error. The problem is thread breaks can be from multiple sources. We can have a needle that needs to be replaced or that is inserted incorrectly, and so it's causing some issue with loop formation. We can have problems with uh, the hook having a burr or the needle plate being scarred or scratched and having something sticking out, some sort of burr that's going to cause breakage and fraying. These things can all happen, so we can have the machine be a part of this. We can have the condition of the machine, but if it's not happening any other time, if you're running reliably, if you switch from one design to the next and you don't see any issues at all, then it's worthwhile looking at the design for a potential flaw. So that's something to look for, folks. Uh, really, it's just one of the things that you have to look for. You have to look for, is it happening at the same place in the design all the time? If it's not, the likelihood it's not uh, particularly related to the file. I know, and this is another thing that we've discussed, and I've seen people get into uh, particularly fights about this, uh, looping. Now, I'm not going to start the fight about looping. What I'm going to say is this. We cannot change tension in our digitized files, largely. If someone is giving you a DST file, folks, there's no way that I can change how much bobbin you are getting. I wish I could sometimes, because if I could actually control tension on the fly like that, there are things that I could do that'd be very, very interesting <laughs> with my embroidery, but we can't. So the truth of the matter is, most of the time, if we're having things that are causing looping and unevenness, in the stitching, especially when it is not uniform, when we're having thread breaks that are not uniform in area, the likelihood is it's something to do that's on the machine. And like I said, I've gone through some of the things that are already happening. One of the other things to remember too, uh, your materials are important. And one thing I've found occasionally that people haven't looked for is that they have thread that is not in good condition. I have uh, been in shops where they have purchased bulk amounts of thread from shops that are closing. And particularly with, say, some rayon thread that's been exposed to the elements for a while, it's something that's very friable. It breaks very easily. If you can take it in your fingers and just pop it apart very easily, putting it under tension, running it through a dense garment, running it through something that has a lot of abrasion, uh, running it fast, you may find that you're getting thread breaks. And the other thing to look for, of course, is threading on the machine. Is the machine threaded correctly? And then watch the thread spool off the machine. I had somebody who was telling me, they're like saying, okay, over and over, Every you know 20 or so stitches it's breaking, or every so many stitches it's breaking, and it's probably more like 100 stitches. It's gonna keep breaking, it's breaking, it's breaking, breaking. And then eventually I asked them, I'm like, okay, watch it coming off of the spool. It turned out that the operator was cutting little notches in their uh, spools of thread and hooking the last little part of the thread off when they took it off the machine. And as it was unspooling from that, that cone, the thread, it was occasionally hooking onto that plastic and snapping look for areas in the thread path that could be causing this problem. So when you're having breakage, all of these things are possible. Is it the file? Most likely it's the file when it's happening at the very same spot every time. So that's something to look for. I really think that's, when we're talking about digitizing versus execution, that's a big deal with thread breaks. So look for that, guys. But the other one I do really wanna talk about in this case is registration. Frequently, this is the other problem people have. Uh, they're usually looking on screen. There's someone who is digitizing. They're freshly digitizing. They're new to digitizing. And they're saying to me, okay, hey, what I have drawn on screen is perfect. Everything's lined up. It looks great. And it's pulling out a registration. That's something that's totally based in the file. Why? Because we know that we're going to have push and pull distortion no matter what. Pull distortion is going to happen. A satin stitch that's this wide is going to get a little thinner as we run it. 
a satin stitch this tall is going to get a little taller as we run it. There is no thing that's going to stop that entirely. We're not going to arrest that distortion entirely, even if we manage it through the use of stabilization, through stabilizers, whether our hoop is tensioned properly, things like that. We are not going to fully arrest that. So if things are perfect on screen, there will be distortion in the fin finished piece. We know that. The thing is that registration is not necessarily that simple. It's not just the pull and push comp. What I will say is, Look to your file for sure. If it is perfect on screen, you are going to get distortion in your hoop. And that's one way you can tell, is it the file? Is it the piece that I'm working on? If there is no compensation, no overlap between elements, if there are no gaps between, say, the end of a satin stitch and a straight stitch border that goes around it, uh, then you're going to have problems. It, there is something to be said for looking for that occasionally first. Also, have you started running on a new material? Are you running on something thicker, stretchier? Are you using a different stabilizer? All these things can be part of it. So what I like to do is bring up some things from uh, uh, an earlier presentation that I did for the Impressions Expo that I didn't get to teach again, sadly. With everything as it has been, I haven't been able to teach all of these things multiple times, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you a few slides uh, in relation to that. But this is one of the slides I like to bring up for everybody. When I'm dealing with teaching digitizers how to think scientifically, it is actually from a, a piece called The Scientific Stitcher, which I've taught both as part of other classes and I teach individually. The first thing I want everybody to do is stop and think simply before you edit. If you are someone who digitizes yourself or you're thinking that there might be a problem with the file, before you start editing, especially if you're trying to edit somebody else's file, if you're somehow stuck and you can't get somebody to work on it, before you start wasting time editing someone else's file, uh, the first thing to look for are execution things that everybody has to deal with. Do you have the correct stabilizer for your garment? Uh, stabilizer, as we know, it has to provide dimensional stability. It has to arrest stretch in the direction, any direction that we're coming from. So when we're looking at our stabilizer, is it correctly used? Do we have the right kind? Like, am I, if, do I need a heavier cutaway stabilizer or something? I'm using a tearaway. And as I chew through that design, more and more stitches go through it. The tearaway, of course, loses structure as it's being perforated over and over. It actually loses its ability to arrest movement. So do I need to use something that's a cutaway instead? Uh, am I using it incorrectly? Let's say someone has a recommended woven stabilizer and you find someone who is not using the woven stabilizer two pieces uh, who are at, at 45 degrees from each other. Because as we know, there's a weak degree. Woven stabilizer being an even weave product, strong horizontally, strong vertically, weak on the 45s. Well, you need two pieces and to offset the angles or you can't cover all the angles of stretch and compression. So are we using our stabilizer correctly? Always isolate that first when we're looking at either puckering, problems like that, puckering, waving, things that are causing issues, three-dimensional issues in the surface of the material, or we're having registration problems where the borders are not matching, we have gaps between elements. Start with this. If your stabilizer is correct, hoop tension. And what I mean by hoop tension is both literally, are, is your hoop, your embroidery hoop, maintaining tension? So can you pull the sides and pieces of the material and is it shifting all over the place? If it's shifting all over the place, then we know that the hoop really isn't placing tension in all the places we need it. So if you're not getting even tension around your hoop, there's a chance that you're just going to have shifting. Now we can compensate for some of that. You can always use pull compensation and uh, push compensation to work on some of that movement. Now it's not going to arrest all of it. And if we have a lot of shifting in the hoop, you're gonna get rippling, you're going to get wrinkling, you're going to get a uh, puckering. You're gonna have some issues if things are moving around but you got to check that hoop tension. I know as a digitizer working in house with operators, I've had operators who refuse to touch the <laughs> tension on the hoops. And I'm like, we should we have had those operators? I don't know. But over the years, I've had operators who would not tension the hoops for different materials. And you have to, you need a nice firm tension. You don't want your material overly stretched because you're going to get rebound when you loosen it up, but you certainly don't want it moving all around in the hoop. So you need to check hoop tension. And I'll go ahead and add as kind of asides to that. If you have material that just will not stay stable, uh, incredibly stretchy, incredibly smooth, slick performance wear, it also might be time for you to say, I might have to use a slight amount of say light embroidery specific adhesive to adhere to my uh, stabilizer if it turns out that the hoop is fine, but the material inside of that hoop, even though we've got nice even tension, just cannot stay stable no matter what we do. Uh, then we can look at adding some adhesives may help that obviously. 
Or if we are digitizing for ourselves, we can use some global underlay or other methods to stitch the material down before we run the meat of the design, the top stitching. Uh, the next thing to look at is thread tension. I've seen people running incredible thread tensions re really high up in the end of their thread tension. And uh, sometimes that can cause a little bit more buckling, puckering. It shouldn't be enough to throw things off of register, but I like to say, let's run at nice, even balanced tension so that we're not getting a lot of compression when we're making that uh, loop, when we're making these stitches. And the other thing is operating speed. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring myself back up for this. I'm sure that you guys have done this. If you haven't done this, then you haven't been an operator for that long, in my opinion. <laughs> You've had a border that is just off. The satin stitch is pulling in just a little too much. The fill is pulling in just a little too much and you have a little edge and you slow the machine down by 100 stitches a minute, 200 stitches a minute, and suddenly it just meets the border, right? Well, it stands to reason if you know that intuitively, if you've ever slowed the machine down to keep the registration, then you understand that the higher your speed is, that we don't really leave the material enough time to relax and uh, kind of spring back between stitches and we're going to get more tension. As we increase that speed, we're increasing that force on making that loop. So we are going to get more distortion with more speed. It's not that you can't work with it. I'm gonna tell you, I have been around digitizers who compensate for all of this and will specifically compensate for like horrible materials that shift for incredible operating speeds by really, really distorting their image in the software. Can you do it? You can do it. But it does mean that it's very specific to the way that that thing is running. And if you try and run it a different way that you probably won't get the results you wanna get. But operating speed is a thing. Not all materials should probably be run full tilt even if we're running late. Better to give ourselves production time to make sure that stuff happens. So operating speed can be a thing. So before we start any editing on a file, uh, I would say unless this is in order, you stand to have some part of this be part of your issue. But let's go ahead and I'm gonna jump to the comments for a minute. It seems like we got a lot of comments stacking up and I've been really kind of getting onto it. So absolutely want to take a look at what's going on in the comments. So let's go ahead and see what's going on. First, I would love to say, uh, John says, I love Fridays and your talks. Could be the most helpful today. I'm super happy that you are here, John. And thank you. I'm glad you like them, man. So thank you. I'm joining in from YouTube. Glad to see some people are taking up on YouTube. Really, uh, Facebook has been the primary kind of channel for this. But I'm glad to see some YouTube people coming in too, because I know that's uh, another place people like to get their information. So that's awesome. Uh, Sonia says, uh, people have different machines and I've come across an unbalanced machine calling instability, uh, the unstable machine causing thread breaks. Avoid putting machine stands on the carpet, not secure. Uh, you know, I haven't had that particular issue, but what I will say is different machines can cause different issues and also machines being in different states of repair. Like I said, being in a shop environment, I have run on machines that actually had I hate to say it like this, but you know, they were broken machines that we were running until we knew we weren't going to run them again. And they had things like uh, a slight variation between the X and Y axis where I added literal dimension. Like I would stretch a design in one axis because I knew that it came up short in the X, even though the Y axis was pretty stable. I have done that before. Am I recommending it? Absolutely not. Get your machine in running order and be sure that you can produce what you need to produce. What I'm gonna say is down in the trenches, absolutely have I digitized something for swing, let's say. So if something is swinging in one way like that, it doesn't work quite right. Yes, I have digitized to do that. The thing about the dichotomy between file and execution, digitizing execution, is it's not really a dichotomy. It's how do you want to balance things? And before I go on to more comments, I'm actually just gonna say this. Before I go on to more comments, it is frequent enough that people will use one or the other to compensate for something else that's going on. So either you are adding more compensation, let's say we're in our digitizing side, we're adding more compensation because we know we are going to have shifting on the machine. We know that we're going to have shifting uh, due to, like I said, pull and push. And some of that is natural, but we might also say, I don't want to use a ton of stabilizer so I'm instead of over stabilizing to keep things being dimensionally stable, I'm going to use a light hand, I'm going to use light densities, I'm going to compensate more for shifting I know is going to happen. There is a dichotomy, we can say that. And I've seen, and I, I wish I had a video ready to show you guys, but there are people out there who have done work that I would never have done, like unstabilized embroidery, where they aren't using stabilizers because they're using incredibly light designs. The thing is they're tuned. The designs are incredibly tuned to that particular purpose. The ones I'm talking about, in fact, it was an applique on a laser bridge machine and all that was done was a bean stitch around the outside edge. Because we weren't stacking a lot of stitches together, they were nice long stitches, not a lot of penetrations in any one point, and we weren't stacking them up, 
this was tuned to be done, and I'm not lying, on a heavy, on a heavy uh, uh, twill, or no, a heavy knit, a heavy jersey knit with another jersey knit layer on top, no stabilizer, large applique. But once again, very little stress was on this thing. What we're trying to balance are the stresses and distortion. If you tried to do the same thing with a bunch of big satin stitches that have all that lined up pull toward the center, it wouldn't have worked. So you can play with this, but the way you can play with this is once you know what forces are going on on the machine. So we'll have to check out what else is going on here, but let's go on with some, a few more things here. We have Christine coming in, and this is absolutely true on materials. Uh, Quality of thread can be a huge issue. Storage can make all the difference. The age of the thread, how it's wound and dyed, all sorts of things can impact your saw when it comes to thread. Absolutely. Uh, I have had some thread, and I don't need to name names or anything. I've had thread that I believe was over-dyed, where a color might have been dyed wrong, and then they over dye it to a darker color or to black, and the black was always breaking in this particular brand of thread. I stopped using it because I believe it was over dyed and uh, processed too much. I don't know. It might not be over dyed. That's what I was told by the old operators I was working with at the time. But the thing is, thread being stored incorrectly can be a problem. Uh, certainly, I like to store my thread when I can in sealed drawers or honestly, glorified Tupperware bins with labels on them organized by the color number. That's how I do it. Uh, honestly, we are in Albuquerque, New Mexico. What we have a lot of is uh, mineral dust and heat and dryness and UV light. And you want to protect your thread from all that stuff because you can have fading and damage and dust building up. And that dust, the Albuquerque dust, I feel like it cuts the thread up when you have a dirty kind of thread. Not that you want dirty thread going on your machine, but I don't want that dust on there at all. And then on top of that, like I said, UV damage and drying out, a uh, thread that gets too dry or too wet can also have issues. I've heard both. I've heard people in super humid climates say that they have issues with their thread being too damp as well. But yeah, you certainly want to make sure it's stored in a protected way. Matt, I'm not even going to try this, but hello from Greece, says Matt. So I'm assuming <laughs> that that's what that is. So thank you for checking in all the way from Greece. All right. So deployed out there. So thank you, Matt, for doing all you do and for checking in. And so any reason I can't offset two pieces of fusible mesh and fuse them both? Uh, I have not done this. I'll just go ahead and admit this. I have not done this. Anybody who wants to weigh in on fusible mesh like this, please weigh in for Leanne. But it's something that I haven't done. I haven't done a lot of fusible mesh. I will say that in my career, a lot of the stretch that we were doing was trying to make sure that we were not doing too many processes to any garment. So uh, heat fusing something, if it didn't need to be fused, was something we did very rarely. It'd be much more likely to see us using a light embroidery adhesive, a specific adhesive. Don't use palette spray screen printers. I know I say that all the time like it does. And people say nobody would use that stuff on, on a mach embroidery machine. Yeah, they will. I've been around to see somebody try it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You don't want to have that heavy, heavy glue, but light embroidery specific adhesives. And Mike says, uh, thread tension, uh, top and bobbin can be balanced, but both still too high or too low, in tune but off key. Yeah, and I believe that that's, like I said, I feel that causes enough distortion, especially on uh, light stuff can be uh, issues for that too. So yeah, I like to keep some light balance tensions. And honestly, there's some people who prefer running rayon thread for that. But what I'm going to say about that, since we talked about materials briefly, I don't usually run rayon thread because most of the stuff I was doing was business to business. And business to business means I may have to deal with industrial laundry. As we know, rayon thread doesn't hold up to chlorine bleach or industrial laundry very well, not very color fast. And here's the other thing about storage, by the way, folks, don't mix your rayons and your polys, no matter what color they are, because uh, I had an operator do that. And uh, let's just say we had we were the proud owners of a lot of uh, pink garments that used to be white lab coats. Once they started using industrial laundry in the hospital for the red thread that was half rayon and half polyester. Shouldn't always happen and not all, all brands react the same, but definitely make sure you are very careful with your storage and use the right materials for the right stuff. So let's go do one more uh, piece here as well. Um, Cindy says, I have always just put mine in totes. Most of the time the lid's not on, had any problems with that. I did recently order some thread, different commercial brand that I had some issues. You know, I'm not one who says that your machine likes a brand, but if you have a brand that's running well for you, there's no reason not to keep with it. Uh, also, like I said, as much as it is nice to get a smoking deal on some thread, when someone closes their doors, remember they may have had that thread on a shelf for 10 years or more, and that's not a good look for the thread. So buying a big box of the threads for people are always uh, difficult. So really that's something that you have to look for uh, in any case. Let's go ahead and go on to some more topics while we're here. I do have some other stuff I want to cover today. I think we could cover this particular topic in incredible detail, but we dealt a little bit of digitizing versus execution. 
the thing that I'll say is start simply, right? Start simply and we're gonna work with that first. And you know, let's go ahead and do this one more time. I'm gonna show you a couple more of those slides. These are things that we've already discussed, but we'll just go ahead and make it clear. Digitizing is always going to be the art of managing distortion. We talked about how we can manage distortion and we can use either side of this thing as, as people have seen. Why do people use too much stabilizer? Whenever you see somebody who's saying, okay, I want a stack of two cutaways. I have a tearaway. I've got a mesh. I'm putting those all together and I have this to make it crisp and this to do this. And they have a big stack that's about the size of a piece of corrugated cardboard Amazon box that's behind their embroidery. Why are they doing that? Well, the truth of the matter is they're managing distortion in the only way they can if they don't digitize. The distortion's already happening. And if they, and let's say this, let's go back to that previous slide. Let's imagine that they've done this that I've said before already. They checked their process and they, maybe they didn't use correct stabilizer is what we're gonna say here, but their hoop seems to be tensioned right. Their thread tension seems right. They're operating at a normal speed, but they can't seem to get anything to run correctly, probably because there is no compensation in their file then the truth of the matter is they're managing distortion the way they can by slapping a bunch of stabilizers on it because the stabilizers will eventually become so stiff that it's very hard for the stitch to pull in or to move. And it's trying to manage distortion. The thing is, it's not the proper way to manage distortion to get what we want. Uh, what we really want is not just a design that looks right, but a design that feels good on the body that is there's something that flows, that looks nice, that doesn't use too many materials, so it doesn't cost us too much, and it doesn't take a lot of prep or a lot of finish work to get it right. So we know that we're trying to manage distortion, but we also need to realize what it is that we want in the end, and what we want is a balanced execution where everything does its part, digitizing does its part, materials do, do their part, machine is in good order does its part, our execution does its part, we have our hoop tension, we have everything correctly done, we have the hoop in correctly, and we are not having any problems in any one of those areas so that when they all come together, we have a garment that is likewise balanced, that it has a nice hand, a nice flow, it is not too stiff, and it feels good to wear, as well as having design look right and be correctly in registration. So when people do use too much stabilizer or when they don't know what's happening, they will just slam stabilizer at it or slow the machine all the way down because they're trying to manage distortion. Uh, if you're someone who's digitizing or you're working with a digitizer, they are also managing distortion by using compensation. And like I said before, perfect on screen. If something is just lining up, you have two elements that are lining up right next to each other and those stitches are just exactly meshing the way you think they should on screen, they're going to then pull apart in the actual piece as the pull compensation and the push or the pull distortion happens. If you don't compensate and overlap, then when they start to pull away from each other, if you don't have that overlap, you're going to have a gap. Easy enough to say, and we understand that in digitizing. The thing is, we may not understand what somebody's looking at that gap, and especially online where everybody's trying to answer someone's question and help them out, they may start slamming in all these other answers that we say, those are not the right answers. Well, the thing is, they might not be the right answers, but they're trying to do the same thing. And it's better if we educate them on what can be done to get that holistic, balanced result that we're looking for, that desired result that deals with all the stress. So once again, perfect on screen means distorted stitches. Distorting something on screen means perfect stitches. So when we're diagnosing, that's the other thing we look at. If someone shows us a file and they show us the problem and the file has perfect edges, all the circles are exactly round and everything looks exactly like the vector rendition of the same logo or graphic, then we know that we're going to have problems in the embroidery and we can say, yep, it's the file. Or if we're looking at a design and the lettering is incredibly thin, and this is another thing I see people asking for diagnosis on all the time. The lettering is incredibly thin, it's falling into the garment. Well, what are we going to look at? We're gonna look at a few things, right? I'm gonna pull this down and just talk to you for a minute. We're gonna look at a few things. Say that lettering is incredibly thin, say it looks like it is disappearing into the fabric. There's a few things that could be happening. Number one, there's no compensation for pull in the file. Then it's a file issue. And even if it's not a file issue, the file can be the fix for it because what it, once again, all we're doing is managing distortion and stress. So we're gonna go ahead and say, yep, we need to make those thicker because honestly, if they're not, if they're this thick in the file and they're coming out this thin, well, we need to make the file thicker on those satin stitches to make those letters pop up and be part of things. Or we need to add some, some support to them. We can add underlay to make that work. It's another way we can handle it but we can do something to keep them from shrinking in. Or if we're looking at the material and the material has a high pile, it is thick, it is furry, it has a nap to it. It can also be sinking in, or it's a material that has a knit or a grain. Sometimes you'll say, okay, what's the other thing we're looking for? Is the distortion happening or the sinking happening only on the vertical or horizontal columns? Because then we can have interaction with the material 
or with the embroidery underneath it. If you're seeing something with edge quality, it's another thing, the same thing. If you're seeing some splitting or weirdness in the edge quality, or if you're seeing weird thinness in a design, here's one you'll see fairly frequently and people don't diagnose correctly. They've got a nice filled area, a bar or a banner, and on top of it is text. And every once in a while, that text seems to be disappearing in an area. And people will tell them all the different things that are wrong with it, and it's pull comp, and it's all this other stuff. And that some of that may be what's going on. But what it usually is is unsupported stitching falling into the grain of the fill behind it. They've got nice long loops on that fill, nice long stitches, and they're at, say, a 45 degree angle, which I hate. You guys all know I don't love 45s because that's also the weak angle of a lot of materials. So it'll cause stretch and it'll cause a puckering, which I'll show you later. But what ends up happening is we have an O. And as the angles in the stitches of the O turn, as you know, the, the O, it turns all through these angles as we go around in the satin stitch. Every time that the angle lines up with the angle of the fill, they fall together. And it falls in. And as it falls in, it's not supported. It sinks in. The pull compensation, the pull distortion lets it sink all the way in if there's no uh, underlay to hold it up. If there aren't rails of edge run underlay, contour underlay, there's nothing to keep it from sinking in both into the material, into that fill, or from going to be really narrow. So what you'll see is an O that's supposed to be entirely round and has looks almost like calligraphy. Two sides of it are sunken in. Is because it's falling into the grain. And that can also happen with material. You'll see somebody running on jersey knit for t-shirts. And what you'll see is all of the vertical stitches are falling in, sinking in, and have rough sawtooth edges on the top. And it's not because there's anything necessarily wrong with the file, unless somebody was told to do the things that they need to do to compensate for that. It's because all of those stitches are falling into the vertical grain, the ribs that are present in jersey knit material. They have a vertical rib and a vertical grain and things can fall into it. Especially you'll see people doing straight stitch lettering or fine kind of black work or red work style engraving style designs and all of the vertical lines, the lines will be turning around and go vertical and all the verticals disappear. Why? They're sinking into the space between the ribs on that material because they're not supported. We can do multiple things to help this. We can use water soluble materials on top, toppings like a solvi is the common topping that people talk about. But, you know, water soluble toppings or films to be on top of that to hold the stitches up temporarily while we're running. Also, we can look to try and not have our stitch angles line up perfectly with the grains. When we're talking about that fill instance where we've got that 45 degree fill, try and find an angle that's not gonna line up that much and put underlay underneath those letters so that they stand up proud of the design. So the angles and the interaction between stitches can be an issue as well. So it's something to definitely ask for folks. And honestly, it's just what you have to work with. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the comments for a minute because I can see we've got some comments popping up as well. Uh, and we're looking for people talking about the threads. Uh, Cindy just said, I've just come to know variegated threads. Most variegated is rayon, double check with ordering variegated. Yeah, if you're using variegated threads, make sure that you are using the proper stuff for the laundry the application that'll be happening. Uh, something to look for too, folks. If you get a thread card, thread cards will usually have laundry symbols on them. The little symbols that you see on the tag inside of a shirt that tell you whether you can iron, uh, what you can do with your dryer. They talk about whether you can use chlorine bleach or dry cleaning. There are thread symbols on a lot, or there are laundry symbols on a lot of those industry thread cards. Go ahead and check that out and make sure that's happening. Uh, Kelly is asking, do we have a top thread tension for glad that you would recommend? And I'm glad that Andrea came up here. Andrea from uh, ZSK in the USA. Uh, Andrea absolutely knows tons about this stuff because that's uh, the awesome ZSK machines that they operate there. She's going to tell you every machine will have different tensions they like. In addition, all threads are different too. For example, ZSK likes a lower looser tension with poly thread. Uh, yeah, I can attest to that. Absolutely runs a looser tension and I like to run that looser tension because I find there's less distortion in it. So uh, nice going on there with that. And also I know Frank runs ZSK. So that's probably why Frank who says that uh, as well. And Here's another one, pull comp versus column width. Uh, this is a technical term, depends on the software you're working on. Uh, pull compensation and column width, generally, um, depending on the software, pull compensation is going to be, uh, is not going to change your underlay inset, whereas column width does. Column width changes the width of the actual drawn column. Pull compensation just adds to the stitch, the top stitching in width. So pull comp versus column width and lettering, that's what that means. Uh, but yeah, we've got, Brian says, uh, most machines are using a, a class 15 bobbin case just under an ounce. Frank's 23 grams is perfect as a baseline. Naturally, machine and thread are variables. The old, the modern way is to use a digital tension gauge. Old timers would dance the loose bobbin case down the thread and just as needed. Absolutely doing the drop test where you 
uh, whip the thread just a little bit and you see if you get about an inch of drop. Yeah, definitely uh, did that before, but do prefer the uh, digital TOA gauge that I have now makes it a little easier to, to uh, register folks. But yeah, and I'll agree. Aaron also says uh, website also lists tensions for threads. You may have to do some adjustment based on the machine as Andrea said, but yeah, I would say go to your go to your thread producer and ask them to start. It's a good starting point and you can work from there folks. So uh, definitely something to look for anyway. But yeah, guys, thread tension can be a part of it, especially when we're talking about minor uh, differences in registration and certainly puckering things like that. And especially remember that the less dimensionally stable the material is that we're working on, the more these things are going to come up. Because no matter what we're talking about, we're talking about faults and embroidery. Unless we're discussing thread breaks, a lot of it really has to do with uh, tension, with distortion, with push and pull. Push and pull, right? That's a big thing that we're going to deal with no matter what. And the more uh, the more ductile, the more flexible that a garment is, and especially that the garment and stabilizer stack that we're putting together is, the more that that can shift, the more we have to deal with the uh, inevitable stresses that we're going to be put on that design. So like I said, it's a holistic thing. All these things go together. And you know what? We all know that the screen is a lie, but I'll go ahead and show this again to you guys. You folks know this. I know you know this. If you're here, you've heard me say it a million times, but you know, the screen is a lie. This is what we see on screen, but it is not what we have ever. And this is the thing when you're looking at the file, the other thing people will also do, every time somebody says, my file looks bad, I always ask them if they've got the stitch out first. Why do I tell you guys to show your stitched samples and not just to show digitals uh, when we're doing something that's serious? It's because the screen is a lie on purpose. We are looking at what we've placed. We're not looking at the eventual piece. And when you're looking at this, we have our push distortions always going to be toward the open ends of the satin column. Pull is always going to be toward the center. And as you can see, since we're going to push out and pull here, this E looks lower than the T, definitely not going to happen in the actual piece. And if you guys were with me discussing typography, you go back to our jargon episodes and talk about typography. Uh, we know that round letters look shorter in a line of text. And so an O, S like this, G's on a font. And you can look at a true type font and see this. They will be taller. They will be below the baseline and over the top height of the caps because the eye tends to make them look smaller. So they are adjusted for what they call optical balance. So you're going to see that if you just throw a ruler underneath a baseline of text, the chance are it's going to look like it's dancing up and down. Uh, it is not necessarily going to turn out that way on your actual piece. But like we said here, guys, these are some of the common corrections that we deal with, poor registration. And this is something that you're going to see all the time. Uh, poor registration happens like this, mostly because we've got too much shifting. But I'm looking at this piece here and I'm saying, all right, this piece is on a stable material. This is on a piece of a uh, pretty heavy canvas. Now I can be having some edge quality issues with canvas, which we're going to talk about again in a second, but this is on a stable material run with plenty of stabilization. Everything else is working, staying in the hoop just fine. The chances are that it's very much going to be a file issue or that I just need to use my file, use my pull compensation to fix it. So compensation like this, measure the distance you missed, compensate accordingly in your file. That's what we do as digitizers. And same thing happens with push compensation here. And if you've been in one of my classes, you've seen me teach this before, stitches push toward the open ends. But the thing you may see is once you see something extending beyond, that can also be not just the initial compensation on each item, but it can be an overall buildup of stress. On this particular piece, um, I will tell you that I had more stress. This thing was popping those fingers out past those lines on my sport shirts. This was being done on a piquet polo shirt. And the event, the original piece that I put out of my machine had these little fingers popping way out beyond those borders. And what I found was it was the overall direction of all the stitching pushing because I was moving it up the arm that you can see here. And I was stitching up that. And then I was stitching the hand and then stitching the fingers. And that gradual push of the material because there is an apparent kind of motion of the stitches in front of that, we are building up material. I was pushing that material toward that center of the design. And as I did so, I was actually distorting it more and more and more. It ended up needing more pull, uh, push compensation. I had to pull back on those sentence stitches, make them shorter more than I usually would because it wasn't just the normal push com or push compensation, push distortion I would assume to have from the satin stitch. It was all of the satin stitches building up together. So the other thing to look for is sequence. If you're having problems, especially when we're talking about things like uh, we're having issues with, say, puckering, rippling, you can also find that the sequence of your design can 
push material and crash it into an existing stitch down element. So if we're having a pucker and it's always between two items, the direction of stitching can be a problem. And then you can say, yep, that's a file issue. If I can move things that they move almost from the center out more like a cap, uh, very likely an issue there. So that's one of those things that happens pretty frequently as well. Um, we've got some other questions. And I'm not, some of these I'm not gonna be able to address, but we'll address some of these other questions while we're here. Um, Randy says, yeah, Richard and Cap, some fine detail. Ugh, yeah, definitely. Running stitch is loose, looping. When the satin stitch goes over it, lots of scruff that needs to be trimmed. Uh, six head machine happens more or less in every head. Probably a tension issue, likely bobbin needle, uh, not enough tension. Uh, and here's the thing I'm going to say with that. There's a couple of other things I will say comes into that. Now, I'm not necessarily going to be able to tell you exactly what's happening, but here's the deal. One of the things that seems to be kind of a shadow issue that I don't see discussed as much when we're talking about uh, tension or looping is also uh, how much friction abrasion we're getting from the material we're running through because you'll see looping because we're not able to let that uh, the needle go smoothly through the material and the loop of thread gets hung up as it's going through. So probably it, it may be a tension issue if it's happening on, on every head. Um, it is tempting to say there may be something else going on there. And people have different feelings about what needle to use for that. Uh, what I would say is that I didn't change my needles a lot. Most of the time I use a 7511 needle, um, but I did often use one that had a larger eye. And uh, people really like, there's a Gross Becker DBK5. I can't remember the whole, uh, the whole classification for it off the top of my head, but I like to use this transitional point. I believe it's called an RG. So it's not entirely a sharp, it's a little more round and the needle is made to give you a little bit better formation. People like to use it on caps and I also like to use it on leather. Uh, that's something that sometimes happens. Sometimes having a needle that allows for the thread to pass through correctly on something that's very heavy, like a structured cap, or like we said, like a light garment leather is still heavy because it's going to grab onto that. Sometimes we get extra tension, extra abrasion, and it's actually from going punching through something that is uh, grabby or that doesn't leave enough space for that thread. And that's something that's, it's a little hard to tie down, but I've found that that can also uh, have an issue at, going through that as well. Especially if you're finding it's not happening any other time, it's just happening on that cap, uh, that can also have that issue. And there we go, thank you for, uh, Andrea bringing that up. The hybrid type needle, the San one. Yeah, and also uh, sometimes people will use the, uh, I think it's called the Gebedor, the um, the titanium coated needle, a uh, great needle. And a lot of people like it for hats and it seems to help some folks who have this kind of issue. So here we go. And thank you very much, Matt's got that right there. Uh, GB DBXK5 7511 RG. That is that is kind of the needle I like to use. Doesn't mean it's going to fix everything for you and you may still have some other tension issues. I would certainly look into, just you know check your tensions on your machine, see what's going on. Uh, but when it's on everything on these Richardson's, it makes me wonder if you're having some other issues with that kind of thing dragging through. Uh, depends on how that's going on. Also, what I'm going to say is if you have incredibly dense stitching underneath detail stitching and then, and then you have something like the underlay doing that, uh, that can cause issues. The other thing to look at is do you need the amount of underlay you have? And definitely, Andrea's right, long stitch lengths. Uh, super long stitch lengths on your underlay. I mean, I don't like a really super short stitch length because then it's not really working out, but it is something that, you know, if you're not getting any stitch length at all, then using that as a as an underlay means that you're not really having the stabilization that you want. Because what you have with an underlay stitch is you have a stitch underneath something that then the other stitches are sitting on top of. You want there to be something there. So you don't want little teeny tiny stitches because you're really not getting that. All you might be getting out of that is some color coverage, say that if we're trying to, say we're at the edge of a satin stitch and we want to cover something underneath here so we get a little bit of color so you don't see the color behind it, then that is good to have any kind of stitch in here to get some color coverage without adding more stitches to the edge of the satin. Um, fine to go ahead and have that there, but I like to have longer links when I can, but yeah, super long stitch links can also cause that as well. So thank you, Andrea, by the way, Andrea VIP for coming through with a bunch of uh, specific information and uh, machine information that, uh, I am always a little reticent to share because I don't know what everybody's running, but I know she's got a lot of, a lot of experience with helping people out with these problems. So definitely something to show you guys. And I would say, you know, when we're talking about, once again, that's probably not a file issue. The only time I would say it's a file issue when we're talking about uh, looping, stuff like that, is if someone is stacking a bunch of full density uh, elements on top of each other, just like pushing your needle through any sort of very grabby or dense material can cause some issues. If you're running 
fills or fi and 15 satins on top of the fills, multiple filled elements. And you're at this one point where multiple things come together and you're trying to keep the borders from coming apart or keeping things from having splits, but you've got too many layers together. And then we drive little tiny details through it, or we're trying to run satin or straight stitches on top of it. I've found that you can get some looping or weirdness going on there or thread breaks. So that's when it can be a file issue. But a lot of the time it may be something to do with your material itself. Also, um, I've had issues with using applique that has pre-applied heat seal material on it. You'll be surprised that that as a, as the needle warms up, as you're running a lot of density through something, running it fast. Uh, I have found issues with that gumming the needle or people are using too many adhesives uh, that you can have some gumming of the needle. And when you have that kind of gummy uh, needle action that you can get some issues with the way it forms a stitch as well. Now that, like I said, a lot of this, I'm just going to tell you directly, this is an experience I've had on machine. This is not something I know scientifically. This is something I know through experimentation and experience. And for me, I would say I've had some issues with that as well. Uh, also materials, I've run a lot of uh, neoprene and foams and materials that were used for uh, orthopedic devices and medical devices. And some of those materials also very grabby and can cause some weirdness in both stitch formation and things like neoprene that sink. I uh, have to use a lot of extra uh, pull compensation because they sink and a allow things to kind of disappear, especially neoprenes that have a pile on them. Believe it or not, there are a lot of medical uh, grade neoprenes that have kind of a fuzzy, almost Terry-like on the uh, top side that goes like that. And here's another one. And I agree with this too, because I've, I've used these as well for people who have needle breakage issues on hats. Um, KK style is also nice because it has a shorter shank and allows the needle to go deeper into the hat. So yeah, KK style, very nice as well. Yeah, for sure. I've seen people using that to great effect when they're having kind of deflection issues and uh, breakage. So yeah, no, seriously, there are other things that go into it. So we have we have the file, we have the execution, but we also have our materials and our needles. So all of these things are possible. I would like to go ahead and bring back up our screen for a minute here. We're not gonna jump through all of these common corrections. We know about push compensation, pull compensation. And we know that we can measure and we can make things happen. So if we have things that are getting narrower, we can add the amount that we want to the file to get the desired result. It's super easy to do this. If you're digitizing, that's fine. But the thing is, we all know without sufficient overlaps, we're going to get some issues here. We all know that the screen is lying to us. So we know that if something's perfect on screen, we can say that's probably where some of this is coming from. Certainly an issue. And uh, what I'd like to say, by the way, I just saw a comment in here from Randy saying, uh, thanks, Eric. I also want to say thank you to Andrea. Thank you to Matthew. Thank you to everybody who jumped in and helped and discussed it. And also thank you about tensions to uh, Brian and Frank for adding in their commentary as well. Everybody's had great commentary. Thank you to all you guys who are watching the take up for all the help you've given me. So also, like I said, when we're overlapping objects, the thing is, it's not just the amount of overlap, but the direction of the pull. We all know that when we're dealing with something like this, pull is in a direction. This is directional. It's the same thing as the distortion on the, on the material. The material has a stretch that is directional. You can feel in the grain of a woven material, which direction stretches more. The interaction between this direction of stretch and our stitch angle, if we know we are pulling, which is gathering on the angle of the stitch, then we also know that if the angle of the stitch lines up with the weakness of our material, this is why I always talk about those 45 degree angles on materials. Most materials, if they're even woven, you have that weakness on the 45 because garments have that vertical and horizontal strength, but they have weakness on the 45 degree angle, a lot of garment materials. If we line up our, our fills on 45 degree angles, we're gonna have issues with that. So it's something else that I'd like to show you guys shortly. I mean, that's something that we talk about when we line up angles. So we can have issues with the alignment of stitch blocks and the alignment of our fabrics. So think about the materials as being a part of this as well. So when you're looking at, hey, something's distorting, the shape is wrong. Here's one of the things we can say, is it the file that made my shape wrong? Well, sometimes it is, but even if it's the file that can be used to fix it, it's not that the file was wrong, but that it is placed incorrectly for the garment. I'm actually going to call myself out. This is the piece that I used in this original class. Hopefully I get to teach some of these classes again, folks, because I really wish I could have gotten more uh, time with everybody with these guys, but this is a common issue and something that I dealt with in my early career. And this is one of the things, shape distortion, right? When you see something like this, some people will tell me, okay, it's stabilizer. Okay, it's the file. Well, the thing is, as with everything, it's both. What I'm going to tell you this time is if I've eliminated the stabilizer, let's see, I saw this piece and somebody was using a tear away and they told me that it started to tear away before the design was done. I might stop and say, well, you're not getting enough stabilization. You need to definitely get in some, you need to have a cutaway. You need to have something that's going to hold up because I'm looking at a fairly light uh, knit polo here and it's going to have a lot of stretch and you've got a fully filled block. 
But if this is supposed to be a square, which it was supposed to be, trust me, uh, using this 45 degree angle, I also am on a weak angle. And you can see that the distortion is very angular. It is specific to the stitch angle of the fill that's in the background. But the thing is, I can eliminate the other stuff. I first look and say the hoop is correct. The stabilizer is right. This is a nice piece of medium cutaway. Nothing's wrong with that. One piece of medium cutaway should probably hold up to this. It's not that bad because the densities are fairly balanced. You can also see there's issues in the text. You see some of those quality issues in the edge of the text? They line right up with the angle of that fill. Also, the tiny text on the bottom. Tiny text on the bottom is having some issues definitely because it's, it is definitely falling into the angle of the fill below it. Uh, so we're going to look at that and say, all right, in this case, the file can still compensate for it no matter what. And I'd say this one, definitely a, a file problem. Why we're getting this kind of distortion. 45 degree fill here, it's pushing to the two corners. And you see that little tiny bit of gold that's sticking out of the top here? That is not some trim or some extra stitches. That is the fill coming to a small point and stretching out beyond the boundaries of where it should be. And we can see that we have stretched the garment. It has gone in this direction. It's push, pushing everything out on that side and it's pulling in the other direction. And we have to avoid that angle and the weakest dimension of the material to make it work. So when we're talking about something like this, that's just a stitch angle problem. If I would have dropped that angle to 15 degrees, 20 degrees, I would have been fine. It wouldn't have caused that problem. And it's still, the reason people do this is because they're thinking they're going to avoid the problem of splitting. You'll see a satin stitch border on the top of a fill and it pulls the stitches in the fill apart when they're directly horizontal. And so it ends up stretching them and we have a little bit of show through right under the satin stitch border. Well, 15 to 20 degrees is enough to stop that. You don't have to be at a full 45 degrees. They're trying to stop that issue and I get why people do it. So what you're seeing all the time is that everybody is attempting to stop the distortion, is attempting to have that going on. They're trying to deal with the problems that are really there. So don't want to say that this is necessarily wrong. People put those 45 degree angles in there for a reason, and it does do one of the things they want to do. It just might cause other distortion, right? The other thing I'll talk about shape distortion briefly is that you have the same issue. We're talking about trying to do the perfect circle. This is where the screen lies to us. If we show a perfect circle on the screen, we're definitely going to get a distortion there. This I would also consider to be a file program problem, something that has to be dealt with in the program, unless, once again, we're not stabilize correctly or you see something moving around too much in the hoop. Once we've identified those things, we can say, yep, it's a file problem. Common correction for this, once again, is to distort the shape in the angle of the stitches. So those are things we can say, okay, that's pretty normal to, to say. But once again, control on this comes from measurement and testing. When we're talking about digitizing, that's the thing I'm going to talk about. But let's go to some other examples of stuff I wanted to talk about briefly. This is another one that it comes up a lot and is actually something that was sent to me. 3D foam issues. Why do I not use edge run underlay on 3D foam? If you see these little bits and pieces sticking out, uh, the person was trying to add density, was asking me, okay, what's going on with this 3D foam? People try to add density to fix this, or they're trying to pre-cut the foam with stitches on the, on the uh, underlay. But what happens is if there's any shifting in the hat, can you do that? Can you use little stitches to pre-cut foam? I've seen people do it and have success with it. What it means though, is if you're too close to the edge of the satin stitch top stitch, when it, the hat shifts, you're going to get these little nubs. The thing is, everybody thinks these are just foam. They are not. These, as you can see, very regular size. Why are they there? Uh, that's because they are actually this underlay stitches falling out to the outside edge and underneath, they have some foam trapped underneath, but those are stitches there. You're not gonna be able to heat those away, cut those away, clip them out, they'll always be there. So that's why I don't use the underlay stitches on the outside. And what I'll say is, whenever you see somebody who has little bumps or stitches sticking out the outside, everybody will tell them, Multiple things that happen. The thing is, multiple things could have made that happen. If your material is shifting, you could have shifting if you do a lot of underlay stitching before you come back to that same area and do top stitching on it. The amount of time you spend away from that area and coming back and stitching all over the, the hat or garment, you may have more distortion kind of racking up as you do all these motions and stitches. And when you get back to it, you don't line back up again if there's too much shifting. But this could be not enough stabilizer, allows shipping or not the right kind of stabilizer can allow shifting. You can, it can be uh, not having enough compensation on your satin stitches. If you are running the underlay just exactly on the edge of that satin stitch before you run the satin, the likelihood is it's going to pop out or occasionally pop out as we have some natural distortion in the shape. So these things can be both, can be the file, can be the execution and can be the material. It could also be that your particular cap is very stiff, has a strange buckram in it that causes a lot of flexing or that doesn't fit very well in the cap gauge and so you're having issues with it moving around. And it can also be your hooping technique. 
with caps, especially if you are not dead on and don't have your caps hooped correctly, stabilized correctly, they will shift, buckle, and wave, uh, especially if you don't have the best control over your sequence with your design. So all these things, like I said, it's a holistic issue, but the great thing is we can change it multiple ways as well. 3D foam, leave the underlay off unless, uh, and use the top stitching to cut the foam. That's the best way I can say it. Don't put edge underlay on there. It's just not worth how much trouble it is to keep it lined up, especially on a structured hat for my money. Uh, if we're talking about a flat garment that's constantly having this underlay sticking out, increase the inset, bring that line further in, especially if we're not having a lot of edge quality issues that we're using that edge to reinforce the edge of the satin stitch and make it look cleaner. If we're not doing that, then bring that edge a little further in. There'll still be some support and some color coverage, but we know that we're going to have a little narrower, uh, a little narrower satin stitch. And we want to make sure that we bring that underlay just a little further in on the inset or increase pull compensation, especially if we don't like how thick those lines are. If we don't like how thick, how wide the satin stitch is, increase pull comp. If we do like how wide it is, increase the inset of the edge underlay. Easily enough done. It's just about managing that distortion, folks. It's always what it's about, managing distortion. And you're gonna see it in other areas always too. I mean, that's something else. I would say same thing's happening here, but this is about shifting. We're seeing shifting up in the top of the crown. You'll see on this particular design at the very top, at the arm of this piece, uh, you're gonna see at the arm of this little crane that's here, this kind of jackhammer, that there's some uh, underlay stitching sticking out. This could be any number of things in this particular piece because it is one color, it doesn't have to register. I'm probably gonna pull that underlay in or maybe even eliminate it or change the style of the underlay to a central, very narrow run because the truth of the matter is I, do, I may not need it for anything. I don't need it necessarily to provide too much stability. The edge quality looks good. We're on a nice kind of poplin hat, very simple. It looks to me like that shifting doesn't cause any damage to the design itself. It's just that I'm getting a little shifting at the top of the crown. And if the underlay was much further to the center or maybe even eliminated, the chances are I wouldn't see it. It's not causing any damage. And because the colors don't have to register to some other color, it's not two colors up there, it's not a big deal. So sometimes you just decide how you're going to mitigate that. And I have to totally appreciate this. This is Andrea says, uh, it's why my every response to a question begins with, well, it depends. Because the truth of the matter is you can attack it anyway. I have had machines that wouldn't run well that you attack with digitizing. I've had garments that don't run well you attack with digitizing. And I've also had digitizing that I was not able to change back before I was a digitizer when I was an operator that you threw more materials at, you ran the design slower because you knew you could get it to run by mitigating how much force, how much stress you were putting on the garment. So yeah, it's totally true. Andrea's right. Sometimes it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't pay to worry why. You just have to tell people sometimes it's different. And this is actually another one that I'll show you. Here's one where you would say, okay, what do you do for this? How do you mitigate the shifting, right? We've got really poor registration. This is a piece that you guys may have seen a good sample of that I actually show when I'm talking about sequencing. And here's the thing. This cap was not really shifting too, too much. This is not something where the cap was terrible. I wouldn't say this is a, an overly awful cap. The thing is, this is a fairly complicated design that I was trying to very carefully manage the over and under pattern of the satin stitches. And with it being a complicated design like this, trying to center this piece out was pretty difficult, right? What it turned out to be was that I ran all of the green area all that was done. And then I was running all back and forth quite a lot on the first half of the gray. By the time I got to the second half of the gray to run it out, I had shifted everything around enough in the run that I couldn't get it to line up with the rest of the green. In this particular piece, I decided to do something that was partially not what I wanted to do. For efficiency's sake, you would run, wanna run all the green and all the gray together. In this particular piece, I actually split them up and ran it half and half. I also cut pieces apart that used to be individual pe or pieces in the gray and ran them. So I had one half that ran after the, the green, one half that ran after the green. So it was green and gray, green and gray. It actually runs in uh, four color changes instead of two. Does that mean it's a little bit more uh, time on the machine? Absolutely it does. However, once it was split into that sequence and centered out more properly, I allowed myself that uh, small amount of loss in the efficiency, I ended up gaining a lot more control over the overall efficacy of that 
piece. We actually had a very nice, clean, fully registered version that came out of it. The problem was I had to give on the fact that I knew I was putting a lot of distortion into this cap. I was running in all these different directions. I've got turning satin stitches all over the place. I have all these over and under in different sequences. In order to get this to run the way that I want, to look the way that I want, and to be reliable so I'm not throwing away one out of three hats, I had to go ahead and lose a little bit of the efficiency and set it up so that I ran one part of the sequence at a time. In this case, you could have very much said, I don't think it's stable enough. It's shifting too much on the machine. It's not framed right. But once I eliminated the things that I could eliminate at the machine, I had to say, what can I do to make this the most reliable it can be? And what I had to do was then change the sequence so that I ran things together in groupings so that I didn't move all over the surface of this very unstable material. And hats are naturally unstable. I didn't go stitching all over it before I finished each area. And I ended up with something that then ran more cleanly. So like I said, multiple things can come into this. It's not all one answer. So really, let's go down to the crux of it. We got to go ahead and go. This is, we're into bonus time. I think we can talk about this again. And I definitely want to bring up more samples, more examples next time. I've got other stuff I want to discuss, but you know, let's, you know, we'll do one more set of samples and then we'll get to it. Bonus time is always a thing. And as Brian often says to me, bonus time doesn't start till an hour and 15 on the take up. We'll do one more example because it's something that I dealt with very recently and I would like to talk about it. But once we do this one last example, I'm going to go ahead and go, just kind of seal the deal on this thing and say, here are the things we thought about. Here are the concepts we dealt with today. Here's the one last example I want to show you. And this is where we talked about materials being part of the issue. Sometimes the file just cannot cope with the materials and the way you're executing, right? This particular piece uh, was done on an incredibly coarse tote bag, woven bamboo, super coarse. And actually the material, despite being bamboo, which is usually very soft, very coarse, very hard in the way that it was put together. And this piece doesn't outwardly look too bad, but if you look toward the center of this piece, you can see stair stepping. You're seeing edge quality issues that look poor. Now, very frequently, this happens to me really frequently with satin stitch text. Somebody will zoom in really tightly on a piece of satin stitch text and say, the edges look terrible. What's wrong with my file? And then they go back to the file, it looks fine. Or they're running something on hats and it looks bad. And they go back and say, it looks great on flats. And part of the problem is they don't realize that materials have a lot to do with it. Let's say that all of them are stabilized correctly. And I'm going to assume that they are. Let's say that they're using the right needle for the right garment.
Hey, everybody. Don't know who's still here. We were already in bonus time. I'll go ahead and shut this down. We had a complete internet outage. I don't know what's going on with that right now. Uh, I'm going to jump briefly back in. I'm just going to share the last little part of this. For anybody who is still here, uh, I know you guys might have already disappeared on me. If so, no harm, no foul, folks. I'm going to go ahead and share one last thing for the last 20 of you guys. You are the diehards. I am so happy to see you guys here. Sorry that that happened, but yeah, I had a complete and total internet outage. Don't know what happened, but we are back on for as long as we can be. Let's go ahead and share our one last little piece of what we're doing here, uh, and we will go from there and be done. That's just how we're going to have to deal with it today. Uh, sorry to tell you guys that, but you know, <laughs> sometimes this stuff happens. We have issues that we can't fix, and uh, it's just something that we have to deal with. We're going to go ahead and drop back out, put in our sample one more time, and discuss briefly on uh, what we were discussing earlier. And really, this is the crux of it. People have edge quality issues, and they often say with satin stitches, they're sent, people will tell them, okay, it's underlay, it's this, it's that. It's not enough density. It's too much density. It's something, and it's causing edge quality issues. Usually there's some sawtoothing or like I'm showing you here, this is what I call stair stepping. These almost pixel like blocks that you're seeing in this particular image. And I'm going to go ahead and go on a really tight shot of it. If you look down in that bottom corner, you see these really heavy pixel like blocks that are happening. Well, the, these heavy pixel like blocks are due to the coarse weave of the material. And it's also why I like to tell people when you're dealing with patches, a lot of people want a very stiff patch badge or emblem, and they will use a coarse weave material like a cotton duck or something that has this really heavy coarse weave. And then they find when they're doing fine detail work that the details wander a lot or they get these horrible edge quality issues. And a lot of the time you don't need a super coarse material. Now this particular piece, I'm gonna say it was supposed to be fairly, uh, you know, fairly loose to have rough edges to look very much like a country execution. This was done, it's a Viking Age piece of art that I drew up uh, based on an uh, Uranus style original from the Viking Age. And uh, this particular piece, I wanted it to have a loose look. And for me, I didn't mind that this on a super coarse tote bag, it was intended to look this way, to look a little homespun. It's tone on tone, it has loose densities. And part of my entire desire on this piece was it for it to look a little homespun and to be a little understated. Having that kind of look didn't bother me at all. The thing is, the first time I did it, the first time I worked on a piece of this course, I was not feeling that way. I was very upset to see this look. Uh, you know, in this particular piece, I was happy to have the only difference between the two, the contrast between kind of the thread and the piece to be a little bit of texture and shine. And that's about it. As you can see in the, the finished piece, I think it was very, very effective. It looked nice. It was very interesting. And the fact that it was tracking with the weave, because the thing is, I did this piece after having worked on a very similar bag and been kind of upset, been stymied by the bag because it was destroying my design. It was cutting things up. The entire edge, edge line of all of my satin stitches were falling apart. Well, it, I then decided that I'd go ahead and run like this and not try and stop that because the eventual end of the pieces, it almost looks like counted work. It almost looks woven. It looks like a part of the garment, a part of the bag rather, a part of the actual accessory because it's tracking with the weave. The thing is, this can happen on a micro scale with something like a hat. We all know that inside of a structured hat, we've got this stiff plastic buckram and often it's very coarse you'll see that you get this same kind of edge quality issue. Somebody has long, straight, narrow, vertical satin stitches on the front of a hat and the crown is shifting a little bit or the buckram is curved. And as they hit the vertical lines in that weave, that every time we get to one of these vertical lines, the satin stitch starts to go across and it grabs the edge. And as we have a little bit of an angle, we get this same stair stepping, right? We still get the same stair stepping that we might have otherwise. And so the issue being that with that, if we're using any kind of needle point that can't go right through something, then we know we're going to have deflection. It's going to go to one side or the other of that very coarse woven material. Now we're talking about the hats. You're not going to punch through that with a needle and you'd be surprised if you do have it where it's punching through, you get like detritus and plastic dust and mess for some of the really dense, heavy, nasty buckrams. But you are going to get some edge quality issues. And part of the issue is that you may have to design around it and say, I can't have super thin satin stitches that are going to have to be, you know, microscopically perfect on an edge. Because if we have, like, especially you see it on a very slight angle, you'll get these awful stair steps on that slight angle. 
just as we get off the vertical, every time we hit one of those vertical lines that's in, in that buckram, the stitches start to, will grab on one for a little while and then eventually grab on the other and it's a step and it's a clear step very much like you're seeing here. So you have to think about the material as well when we're diagnosing these things. Sometimes it is just the hat you're working on and it's something that you almost can't work around without just designing around the fact that there's going to be some of that distortion. Certainly edge run underlay or contour underlay, depending on your software, will help when you have just sawtoothing that's normal, which is where you just have a tighter, you're on the inside edge of a curve is tighter than the outside edge with a satin stitch always. And if you have some nice satin stitch edging here or uh, some edge contour on that, it has a rail that it can grab onto and it has something to cover a little bit of the color. And if it's pulling and you have that nice rail, as the, the uh, satin stitches pull, they will grab onto that rail and stay in place. So that's something else you can get from having that contour underlay. But the thing is, sometimes on this material is going to happen. Now, on a woven like this, people will say use a sharp and a sharp needle point can help because it will actually go through the bundle of fibers that is that coarse material, especially on this bamboo tote. If I really wanted to, I could probably run a nice uh, heavy gauge sharp. And I bet you I probably would have had less deflection than you're seeing here instead of, because this is like an RG point um, 7511, just like anything else I would usually run. I didn't try to fix it because I didn't think I needed to. So that's one of those things you can do is run a sharp. Certainly you're going to be running that sharp on the hats perhaps and see how that works for you. But the truth of the matter is on a super coarse material, there's likely to be some stair stepping and edge quality issues. But what I'd like to remind you guys to do is evaluate things at a standard distance at which they would be seen, like we always tell our customers to do, evaluate them at that distance, don't evaluate them under a magnifying glass. So with that, yeah, guys, and I'm gonna go ahead and mention everybody here. Yeah, diagnosing YouTube issues, yep, totally. Am I still there? I guess it froze. Yep, glad I'm back, thank you. Jeff's like, oh, my internet must have froze. Nope, mine turns out. It cut right out and I had no connection. And as Brian says, the joys of live presentation, yep, the joy of going live, folks, always. But what I will go ahead and do is let's go ahead and tighten this up, put a bow on it. We're 15 minutes over, so it must be about time to quit. But let's just go ahead and go over what we talked about today. Digitizing versus execution. Uh, do the simple thing, folks. Keep it simple. Take the execution out of it first. Look and make sure that you have stabilizer that's right, that your hoops are evenly uh, tensioned all the way around. We're not getting sliding, slipping, any sort of looseness or shifting and work on that as far as materials and execution. Uh, also, if you're running hell bent for leather on a gossamer material that can barely hold up to it, maybe slow down your stitching a little bit and make sure that you have your tensions in line. So keep it simple, uh, keep it scientific. If you're having a lot of issues, if you change everything in the world, add a bunch of materials, do a bunch of work on the design and you don't know what's happening, you know, you're not gonna really know what did what. So change one thing at a time when you can, especially if you're testing something new, but do make sure you're starting from a baseline of settings that work, of settings that you can trust. Uh, also, the other thing I wanna talk about, we're always just trying to manage stress on the garment. We know there's going to be distortion. We know we're gonna be dealing with it. So think about that stress and realize that all we're really after is a desired result. The desired result being that we have a garment that has a design that looks good, where the outlines register the way they should, and that also feels good for a client to wear, holds up under the right conditions for laundry and for use. That's the desired result. However we get to the desired result works. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to advocate slapping a bunch of stabilizers behind a material that's not working for you when you don't have access to the design. You need to have that design repaired, but that's part of the desired result. It is a holistic thing we're looking for. All of the different angles have to come together to help out to make things work because we want it to be good for everyone, right? We want it to be good for us. It should run reliably. We shouldn't have to do a bunch of extra labor on it. We shouldn't have to use materials that are more than the standard to make it work. And it should be good for the digitizer. You shouldn't be asking for edits every two seconds because it should be done correctly for the proper material. It shouldn't be a problem there. and We shouldn't be accusing them of stuff if we're not hooping correctly. It should be good for the client, for the customer. It should feel good when it's worn. It should wash properly. It should look nice and not be stiff or horrible to have on your body. And it should work for the design that is involved. The design should look the way it should look. And we should know that. But the thing is, what we're really working on though is this this kind of issue too. We know we're gonna have shifting. We know we have distortion. So the two things that we can do, we can try and eliminate the distortion. Now we're not going to eliminate all of it, but that's where people come from the material side of things. Use a stable material, make sure the stabilizer is there. And sometimes people are overusing stabilizer to try and make this happen, or we compensate. And that's what we can do when we're dealing with the digitizing with the file or working with our digitizer. We make sure that there is enough compensation in the design that despite the fact 
that we're going to have distortion. It comes out looking right in the end. And what I'd say is honestly, it's not eliminate versus compensate. It's eliminate and compensate. To the best of our degree that we can, we eliminate excess shifting. We eliminate excess stretch. We arrest excess movement by hooping correctly, using the right stabilizers, keeping our tensions balanced, and making sure we're running at a speed that is reasonable for the garment, for the material that we're running on. And we also then compensate, either if we are digitizers, by knowing that we need to compensate, knowing that we need overlaps, working toward having balanced density so that we don't have ex either excess show through because we're not using the right, uh, the right amount of density or the right amount of underlay or kind of underlay to help hold up the top stitching and cover, or that we're not using too much of it so we're not causing buckling, rippling, shifting from having too much uh, too much density, too much stacking up of thread or multiple layers or multiple elements on top of each other that are causing excess distortion, thread breaks and issues. So really it's not eliminate versus compensate, it's eliminate and compensate. Eliminate as much of the stretch and distortion as we can in the execution and compensate in the file so that we get the proper result. With that folks, I'm going to go ahead and let that go <laughs> let's let this poor show go. It obviously is about ready to go and hopefully our internet connection will hold up again for next time. But with that, uh, it has been fantastic being with you guys on the take up. If you liked this, uh, there's always more for me. You want to go check out some of the latest stuff I have going on right now. Um, Images Magazine out of the UK, and I will go ahead and drop this link into the comments as I leave. Uh, Images has a digital copy of this. We talked briefly earlier about process, about a couple episodes back, we talked about process, we talked about keeping things together and how to hoop correctly and how to keep everything reliable and repeatable. Well, this is all about hooping and has some details about that. And it's a great, great magazine out of the UK and it's a nice article. So I'd like for you guys to go check that out. Definitely check out all the things that are happening with Imbrilliance. Check out Imbrilliance.com. Got new things coming out there and we are always testing new fun stuff. So check us out on social media as well. But yeah, Imbrilliance.com and everywhere on social media, as, as you know, uh, Brian also, great supporter of the show, great supporter of me because I'm someone who's working with those folks to make software what it is. And honestly, share this. Subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube. Follow me on Facebook. Share with some friends. Like, comment, subscribe, as they always say with the YouTubers, right? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to smash the like button. I'm not going to tell you to ring the bell. But hey, if you want to have those notifications on, I would love to have you here because the interaction that we've had in the comments was fantastic. And it makes my Friday to have you guys join in. So I hope you guys understand some of the stuff we've gotten done here today. If it was new to you, go back, think about it, run some designs and watch them. But here's the thing. Always think of this holistically. There are multiple ways for anything to get done. Nothing I say is gospel. Test for yourself and look at what things happen. Open your eyes, open your minds, watch what's going on on the machine, watch the way things interact and take that holistic view. Get conscious of how stitches work and the interaction between needle, thread, fabric, machine settings and the design. And really it is something that is almost meditative altogether to look at. So it's something inspiring, something wonderful. And I would love to help you guys on your journey with embroidery again next week.